Welcome everyone to tonight's talk, The Evolution of Disaster Capitalism, Fine-Tuning Shock Doctrine Style Policies. And welcome to our panelists. Thank you for coming and sharing your experiences here on this panel tonight. The event is being co-sponsored by The Independent Newspaper, a free newspaper for free people, and of course, The Breck Forum. My name is Judith De Los Santos. I'm with the Breck Forum, along with my colleague, RuPaul Osa, put together this panel. And uh, we, well, I will be moderating tonight. Unfortunately, we've had a last minute cancellation. Uh, Tracy Washington won't be, she was unable to make it. And so therefore, Beverly Bell will be filling in with uh, a lot of the New Orleans information. Uh, so let me introduce our guest, uh, Ezili Danto of Haitian Lawyers Leadership Network. Beverly Bell of Other Worlds Are Possible, Adana Usmani of Action for a Progressive Pakistan, and Kambale Musabuli of Friends of the Congo. Okay. Welcome. <clears throat> the end of the first decade of this new millennium has been marked by some of the worst natural disasters that have displaced and killed millions of people. Worst nat uh, natural disasters. This is what the media has coined as the ma aftermath we encounter, where the aftermath is beginning to mirror the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and have generated a complicated and fractured terrain on which human rights and economic justice are seriously compromised. In her book, The Shock Doctrine, Naomi Klein describes this as such. Countries are shocked by war, terror attacks, coup d'etats, and natural disasters. And then they are shocked again by corporations and politicians who exploit the fear and disorientation of this first shock to push through economic shock uh, therapy. In essence, the uses of disaster conditions to push through economic policies that a population would less likely be able to accept under normal circumstances. Within this decade alone, we have seen the earthquake in Jurat, Ju, Juharat, India in 2001, volcanic eruptions in the D Democratic Republic of Congo, in 2002, as well as war conflicts within the Great Lakes uh, region in Africa, the earthquakes in China and Algeria in 2003, the tsunamis of 2004, the earthquakes in Pakistan's Northwest Frontier province in 2005, uh, Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans later that same year, the earthquakes in Haiti and Chile, in 2010, and now the cholera outbreak Haiti is currently experiencing, along with Hurricane Tomas. Today we'll take a look at what disaster capitalism has meant in this decade. A concept that is not new, however, with the frequency of occurrences of these disasters, especially in this decade, one has to wonder has disaster capitalism evolved? What does it look like in these specific regions? What trends are evident? Under these circumstances, how are groups organizing? If uh, each of the panels can name some concrete examples of successful uh, campaigns and how can we support them? And also, uh, we are going to end on the note, what structures of accountability can we strengthen or generate? With that, I give you our first uh, speaker, uh, Izili Danto, who is going to be talking about Haiti. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, to the Breg Forum. I think this is my second time here and I truly appreciate it. 
And I um, thank you for coming and for being interested in Haiti. And what we do at the Haitian Lawyers Leadership, I was born in Haiti and raised in America. I first went back to Haiti as an attorney for President Jean-Pierre Aristide, and that was in 1994. And uh, I have been running the Haitian Lawyers Leadership Network since. Um, the experience of that is the reason that I'm sitting here today. The experience of what folks might call disaster capitalism. I, I say Haitians have been facing the barbarity of the West since 1503 when um, the first boatload of Africans were chained and brought to Haiti, the first place that we were that the Africans were brought to. Um, and so though now it has this name of disaster capitalism, I'm going to talk within the context of what I know as a Haitian woman, as a Haitian lawyer, and as a Haitian activist who went back to Haiti trying to bring a new paradigm to Haiti and finding out that um, the United States Agency for International Development, the US, France, and Canada, and all of the Western countries do not want development in Haiti. So, so that was a wake-up call for me um, because I did believe in, you know, I pledge allegiance to the flag, you know, for you know, justice for all. But for my people, the one person, one vote rule does not apply. For my people, the, um, and, and, and obviously you know there was two Bush coup d'etats against President Javier Aristide, the first democratically elected president of Haiti, um, one in uh, 1991 under Bush Sr. and the other in um, 2004 under Bush the Lesser. So, um, and that was because the United States does not want to see the masses of Haiti. There are 10 million people in Haiti and point, maybe 0.5 percent of the Haitian wealth is owned and mediated by the Haitian oligarchy. And that Haitian oligarchy are the subcontractors for companies that want to use Haitian labor and exploit Haitian labor for the benefit of the world's corporatocracy. But the narrative in Haiti is totally different. You will not learn about the Haitian oligarchy. You won't know who Bijou is, who the Mervs are, who Accra are, who Brants are. And that's really what needs to be done. The, the real, we cannot change what's happening in Haiti without first understanding the lifting up the mask. So if, we, if we're looking at this in terms of um, the shock doctrine, humanitarian aid is used to mask exploitation, or what others call a disaster capitalism. So um, let me give some specific examples. So um, there, when I got to Haiti in 1994, it was after three years of, um, of, of a lot of Haitian in the diaspora. Um, that shouldn't be me, I'm so sorry. Um, thank you. Okay, the phone never rings. I will take it off. Um, All right, so um, why does the United States uh, keep Haiti contained in poverty? Why? Um, you all know that we just had an a, a earthquake on January 12th, and that earthquake in 33 seconds killed over 300,000 people. I was in Haiti about a week after that, and if they're saying 300,000, I'm going to say to you that it's, it's much more than that. I mean, they don't have the figures, really. Because 98% of the rubble, 10, 11 months later, is still on the ground. So if they didn't lift up the rubble, you know, some people still there. They're just decomposing. 
So we had a situation in Haiti where uh, on January you know, 12th, the United States came into Haiti on, on the 14th and militarized aid and came in as humanitarians. At least that is the, that is the, that is the uh, handle that you know, Anderson Cooper and CNN will tell you about. Okay? But um, the, the, the fact of the matter is, it's not about Haitian rights. It's not about Haitian uh, development. Haiti is used in various ways by the United States. And, and you can give it the name shock doctrine, you can give it the name disaster capitalism, but for us, capitalism was the reason why there was enslavement, why we had 300 years of being um, property. Okay, so Naomi Klein didn't have to give this a name, we already knew what that name was. This sort of enslavement, sort of chattel enslavement, was taken down by Haiti in 1804. But since that time, now that was after 300 years of slavery, and the, 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 the missionaries came, and, and I think it's the same thing for Africa as it is for Haiti, you know, told you they were enslaving you in order so that you could you know, save your soul. Now they tell us they have come to Haiti to help us develop. They have come to Haiti, there's about 16,000 NGOs in Haiti upwards to 16,000. Before the earthquake, it was about maybe 10,000. Per capital, there are more charitable organizations in Haiti than anywhere else in the world, and yet, and yet, 10 months later, let's look at the statistics. 10 months later, there's the, what, the, the statistics that they're giving, we give higher statistics, but the, the CNN statistics, the mainstream statistics, that there's 1.3 million people on the streets homeless living under really tarps, basically, in sheets. It's the hurricane season. Those same people um, lost their property and are living within the rubble. How much money was gathered during that time when you know, CNN and Obama decided that, you know, you need to give your money to Red Cross, you need to give your money to the Bush Clinton Fund. The amount of money that has been collected, uh, approximately, we're saying that um, there's over a billion dollars collected by private charities. Private charities meaning Red Cross, it doesn't have you as a constituency, it has a private board by Catholic Relief Services, World Vision, Oxfam, all of these NGOs, all right? They collect money. Today, if we just look at the Bush Clinton Fund, what they're saying is that the money they have collected, the Bush Clinton Fund themselves have collected $52 million, and they're basically saying, you know, 10 months later, we haven't used it, we're collecting interest, the people are dying, now remember, we just had the hurricane season. We're, ha we're in the hurricane season. We've had storms. And I won't get to cholera for a minute, but you all know, since I don't have that much time, so let me just get it to it. It's imported. So they came to us to bring stability, democracy. They destabilized Haiti first, okay? So when I said that the one person, one rule doesn't apply to us, they took down President Aristide, who was duly elected, and deported him to Africa. Why? Because he had raised the minimum wage. Why? Because he had decided that Haitians deserve to have freedom of religion, and Vodun is a religion of Haiti, a spirituality of Haiti, and it should also, in addition to Catholicism and other religions, be, 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 be part of what Haiti is about because he had demobilized the army which was left to Haiti by the United States during their 19th year occupation. People ask me all the time, why is Haiti the way it is? Why is it uh, uh, poor? I'm just gonna give one example because we don't have time. The independence debt, Haiti paid for 122 years a debt to France for my ancestors winning their freedom and getting rid of slavery. We had to pay. That payment benefited 
the United States because of the Louisiana Purchase, which brought the United States double its size. And also, folks from Louisiana who had moved up from Haiti kept their and um, were paid indemnity. So we helped develop Haiti, um, excuse me, the United States, with a lot, in a lot of different ways. That is our purpose in accordance to Bill Clinton, Mama Clinton, Papa Clinton, Bush, the same. Whether it's Democrats or Republicans, Haitians suffer exactly the same. It's just a different manner of genocide. And right now there is a genocide going on in Haiti. And I, 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 um, I want to give some very specific examples about what that means. So you have um, in Haiti at the moment a, um, a scenario where upwards to 16, well, before January, before the earthquake, we already help, had help in Haiti. We had the UN. And there were, there were 9,000 troops in the UN. They were making $610 million per year. They had been there for six years. So they had collected over $3 billion in our name to bring us democracy, to bring us development. Not one pipe for clean water has been laid in the six years that the UN has been there. Not one. Clinton and Bush were assigned by Obama to come and help us doing this, this, this amazing natural disaster. And, and I, I put natural disaster in quotation marks. You see? So, 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 so um, what did Clinton and Obama do to earn the position of coming to Haiti to be the Clinton-Obama fund to help Haitians recover? What? We know Clinton from the Rwanda genocide. We know Clinton just apologized right after the earthquake for destroying Haiti's agriculture. He apologized. He said, my policies when I was in office helped destroy the Haitian agriculture. So what qualifies him now to be nominated by himself or the UN? It wasn't a Haitian that decided. But now he is the head, co-head with the Prime Minister of Haiti of what they call the Haiti Recovery Committee or whatever that is. So supposedly, Clinton and Mr. the Prime Minister is going to look at what the donor countries, remember I say that the, 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 there's been charitable funds and they say, the, the, the statistics I've read is that uh, out of every household, like half of the American households, opened up their pocketbooks because of the earthquake and gave money to organizations. They expected when they gave that money, Americans expected it was for emergency help. You see? Today, if you ask any of these folks that collected the money, they're going to say to you, oh, we're holding on to it for long-term development. So they're not using it for emergency help. If you look at the donor countries who pledged money in March of 2010 to Haiti after the earthquake, less than 10% of them have actually given what they have pledged. The United States, for instance, pledged through Hillary Clinton's Secretary of State $1.1 billion to Haiti for development. Not one penny has been delivered with that money. Small, tiny countries have put in their money, like Estonia. But meanwhile, meanwhile, we have this narrative, and this is what I do at the Haitian Lawyers Leadership. If we want something to change in Haiti, we must change the narrative. The narrative, the colonial blueprint, they've used it in Bosnia, they've used it in Congo, they've used it in Rwanda, they've used it everywhere that they've pillaged, and plundered and exploited is that Haiti has nothing, no riches, and the United States and the Western countries, Canada and France, have come in to help us. That's the narrative. If you believe that narrative, then you're unconscious. 
And that's a period, not a comma. I've been doing this for a long time. And if you believe what CNN is saying to you, if you believe what um, New York Times is saying to you about Haiti, half of what they say about Haiti is half truths. So they tell you, the narrative is, Haiti has nothing, Haiti is corrupt, violent, and without assets. At the Haitian Lawyers Leadership, we say the exact opposite. We say they have come to plunder and to get riches. We say Haiti's riches is the reason why the United States landed in Haiti 20,000 troops on January 14th. Haiti lies between Venezuela and Cuba. It's strategic place in the arena where the United States wants to govern. Those two countries are two countries that have not followed the capitalist uh, model you see? And Haitians, Haitian peasants, the tiny Haitian peasants, they have a model that, that, that existed before Lenin and Marx. And that model scares United States policymakers. It is a model where you wake up, you own the property that you're in, and you go out and you eat off of the land and you work in combination with your neighbors to build. It's called a kumbit. Tiny, but it's in Haiti. It bothers the United States so much that in their policy, Clinton's policy was to force the Haitians on the outback to move into um, the city and um, work for their factories and become these workers. So when they, they did everything they could to destroy the Haitian peasant, okay? I'm just gonna give you one example. The Haitian peasants had this, the, their livestock, their most important life, livestock was their black pigs. And that's what they used to, they would sell these black pigs at points in time during the season in order to send their kids to, to, to school. The United States came and killed 1.3 million of the hay, slaughtered their pigs, slaughtered peasant farmers' livestock because they said that it had um, some sort of a disease which they never could prove. Once they did that and impoverished those Haitian uh, farmers, they, they had to, many of them moved into the city, if the capital of Haiti, and that's where they would meet. And, and, it, and, and, and of course, you know, the idea of um, assembly plants, this is what um, the UN thinks is development for Haiti. The UN says that Haiti wants to be competitive with China. Now they're talking for me. They're talking for Haitians. They say, we want to be competitive for China. What they really mean is this. When Obama is down there in India, he wants to tell the Indian, the Indian government, the Pakistani government, don't you dare raise your raises. Don't you raise your, 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 your minimum wage. Don't raise it to the level where our corporations um, don't want you to raise it. So they will say things like, if you do, we're just gonna take it to Haiti because you pay, we're paying them 25 cents an hour. So they use us in that manner. We're basically, we're basically um, re-enslaved in Haiti, recolonized, but it's um, because the narrative is Haitians have nothing, so if we bring them assembly plants, then we've given them something. I want you to understand that what do we have? There is oil in Haiti, we, we, there is iridium, there is gold. During the um, coup d'etat uh, uh, between President, uh, in the years that President Aristide was there, President Prevost was there, companies from uh, Canada are mining in Haiti. Since 2004, they've been mining. They've been mining in the North Mountains. Um, they are, they are, so, so all of this information you can find on my website. You won't find Haiti's riches anyplace else. No one will tell you that the United States barters Haitians as if, as if we belong to them. You see, Obama will just say, Cheney, 
Negropana, all of these folks will just say, you know, um, we'll use Haitian labor. Not that they will, eventually, you see, they use that in further trades. They, um, so the earthquake happened, the United States collected all of this money, it's never reached the people, they're still on the streets, and what's worse right now is that um, they've imported to us a new disease, and it's called cholera. Haiti never had cholera before. We have had hurricanes, we have had a lot of uh, 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 flooding in our history. And cholera is a disease that comes through, uh, uh, it's a waterborne disease where you get diarrhea and it, it's easily uh, treated, but if there is no, sanit if, if there's no health uh, infrastructure, people die. Just last week, the CDC went down to Haiti and said that this is from South Asia, it's not Haitian, and it was imported, but we're not going to look at the source. You see, if it was my people that had brought some disease in the Western Hemisphere, as they said you know, before with AIDS, somebody would look to uh, uh, quarantine those that were bringing it. Those soldiers are still there. No one's quarantining anybody. You see? Because the value of our lives as Haitians means zilch. Our only purpose is to make money for the charities, for the corporations, and for the assets of our country to be used by those with monopolies. You know, I think it was Bush that said, I am going to, um, what did he say? He said something about the free market system where he was going to uh, eschew the, 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 the free market system in order to save the free market system when he did his bailout. There's something really weird like that, he said. Um, there's never been, truly, a free market system. In Haiti, it's about monopolies. The same family does all of the school uniforms for the entire country, and they've had this monopoly. The same families have a, 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 the fuel monopoly. You know, it's just monopolies, and that's how the United States is, like you don't see it though. Those monopolies in Haiti right now, um, the pharmaceutical companies from America, the oil companies from America, you see, they're the ones benefiting from this disaster capitalism. How do they benefit? The United States, Pentagon, the USAID, they, now I'll give you that example of the agriculture. I, I said to you that Bill Clinton apologized for destroying Haiti's agriculture. The way they did that was they had uh, subsidized big agribusiness in America, Arkansas farmers, right? They subsidized them, and then they dumped it in Haiti. Excuse me? Okay. And then they dumped, they dumped that in Haiti. Now, when they did that, right, the, 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 the small Haitian farmer who was bringing his, 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 his uh, crops to market couldn't compete with stuff that was dumped in Haiti from big agribusiness. So he moved, or his family had to move into the city to try to find factory jobs. When the Chinese brought down their labor force, or the Indians brought down their labor force, the factories that were in Haiti left and went over there. And that left the slums of Cité Soleil, the people that had moved into the area of the capital. That's why you have Cité Soleil. Now those folks in Cité Soleil, at some point in time, around 19... Um, you know, they helped to bring President Aristide to power. They were massacred by the folks that the United States of America trained at Fort Benning or at Ecuador, who headed the Haitian army, massacred between, between 1991 to 1994 when President Aristide came back, okay? And that was Bush the first coup d'etat. So when I say to you the legacy of impunity and violence, it normally comes from the supporting of the oligarchy 
and imperialism in Haiti. So, so, so as a lawyer, when I went back to Haiti, I thought that I could uh, bring about judicial reform. Clinton said he wanted Haitians to go and help Haiti. That was back in 1994. But when I got to Haiti, I was told that unless I work for an NGO, unless I work for a USAID, unless I work to bring about the uh, idea of Haiti that the United States wanted, which is they want us to look like the Dominican Republic, they want us look, to look like Jamaica, where we're maids, butlers, and um, props to a tourist industry, and where your land is owned by foreign tourists and the Haitian oligarchy, and you're just like props, you're just their maids and butlers, okay? So that is what the United States, it's, I call it false benevolence, at the Haitian Lawyers Leadership, we do the counter-colonial narrative. We were the first to bring, to push this cholera that is not Haitian and push and try to get mainstream media like the Reuters and Al Jazeera and, uh, and uh, so forth to actually go to the place where the Nepalese base are, where the soldiers were putting their raw feces into the Haitian river that gave the people this cholera. But you won't hear this on CNN because we're supposed to be diseased. But if we had been diseased, remember we have hurricanes and flooding all the time in Haiti. You would have known about it a long time ago. So they have brought to us all of this destruction, destroying of our agriculture, destroying of our uh, livestock, destruction of our, even our health, and destruction of our ability, or when we try to, to, to elect a president that would use the assets of the country to develop the country and to bring sanitation, uh, communication, electricity, uh, health. The United States says you've got to leave that to the free market. One thing, let me just say, Okay, can you quickly mention something about the mining industry very quickly? Just a few comments. So, yes. Um, the, the, there are mining, mining companies. The, they didn't like what President Aristide wanted. What President Aristide wanted in Haiti um, was to have a, a, a sort of what, what America has that it doesn't, doesn't talk about, a mixed economy, sort of a private public partnership where the assets of the country, because you know, he had identified the assets of the country for the first time for the people of Haiti, and they were mining, I mean, excuse me, there were gold and iridium and all these, and they're, they're in the north of Haiti in the mountains. We are a country of lots of mountains, and we are one of the oldest land masses of the Americas. So, so it's very pure um, 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 uh, uh, products. These um, companies, once, we be, once the Bush administration brought in uh, the UN occupation, they, there's no concern, there's nothing about Haitian environmental protection. There's nothing about you know, what, is, what, what are Haitians getting out of this mining. So mining has been going on in Haiti since 2004 for, for, by uh, companies like Majesco, St. Genevieve, um, companies that come from America, and they're mining. And, and the, um, I wrote, actually, in 2009, and today people are quoting it. I, someone quoted it and, and sent it to me because I had totally forgotten. I, I, I have a piece out that says, um, um, uh, uh, did the mining in Haiti cause the earthquake? Because drilling does uh, destabilize fault lines. And so I had asked that question. But in asking those questions, I, I um, had talked about the fragility of the Haitian environment and, and how we have been exploited for so long. And I had asked, what, is it, what, what would happen if these benevolent folks came in and poisoned the Artibonit area, which is the area of where the Haitian breadbasket is, where we actually fed our people for, for centuries. And today, the, the cholera didn't start out in Port-au-Prince where the people are in the streets. It started in the rural area. And it's because of, of the poisoning of the Artibonite River. Um, so mining in Haiti is going on right now. For gold mining, you know they use all sorts of toxic chemicals. And those things are seeping into the system. 
our people have no no health um, protection, no environmental protections. So, so, so it, we have we don't even know what the um, significance of all of that mining is because Haitians have been disenfranchised and we are under occupation. Thank you very much. We'll take questions afterwards when all of the panelists have had a chance to speak. Next up, we have uh, Beverly Bell of Other Worlds Are Possible. Thank you, I'm so delighted to be here. And I have um, a dual perspective on the world as a fourth generation New Orleanian who was born, raised, and live in New Orleans and who has worked in Haiti with popular movements for 30 years. So I'm going to speak about both, a little bit of comparison, building off of what Ezuli spoke about, but also adding a little bit of a New Orleans um, element to it. You all probably know there have always been many similarities between Haiti and the U.S. They are historic, they are cultural, they go deep, they are very strong. People in New Orleans are extremely proud of them today, but perhaps they've never been closer, certainly not economically, than since Katrina and the subsequent flooding in 2005 and then the Haitian earthquake of January 2010. On the plane this morning coming up from New Orleans, I was trying to make a list of the comparisons between New Orleans and Haiti in terms of disaster capitalism. A brief list, and I got up to about six pages. So it's, they're, they're very, very deep, and I'll just try and pare them down very quickly because I don't have much time. But in both cases, we have seen how poverty and capitalism represent big business. It's what Jordan Flaherty, in his wonderful, wonderful new book, Floodlines, sort of the consummate story of disaster capitalism in New Orleans. I can't recommend it enough. But it's what he called corporatization, militarization, and privatization of aid. In, this is loud. in both cases, the devastation of the catastrophe was only partly about nature. Remember that Hurricane Katrina didn't even hit New Orleans. It actually dodged New Orleans but it was mainly about the context of classism, racism, and exclusion. In both cases, black people were characterized as savages who needed to be policed. In both cases, the media falsely reported looting and violence in what was actually a very calm situation. In Louisiana, Governor Blanco put out a shoot to kill order. And in Haiti, the very first response to this traumatized and devastated nation was to send in the military, as Ezuli said, 20,000 U.S. troops and 12,500 U.N. troops. In both cases, the majority population, which is extremely poor, was left out of all formal decision making and has not benefited from these decisions. Both peoples have been denied the right to return, guaranteed in the UN principles for inter internally displaced people. And this right to return includes, among other things, quote, full participation in the planning and management in their return or resettlement and reintegration. And, quote, the right to participate fully and equally in public affairs at all levels and to have equal access to public services. In both places, we have seen disaster aid turned into aid disasters. In both cases, aid was diverted to outsiders to control it because it was believed that the local population was too corrupt. In both cases, the elite have been seeking to remake the area in their own image, that is a more efficient Western dominant culture image, minus the backward third world element. Both cases created new maneuvering room for these new neoliberal models to be imposed. Just to give one indicator, in a few days after the storm in New Orleans, the Foundry, which is the blog of the Heritage Foundation, said, quote, few people could have predicted the improvements in education that would result, but sometimes things get so bad that radical change can happen. Days after the earthquake in Haiti, that same blog published a piece entitled Amidst the Suffering, Crisis in Haiti Offers Opportunities to the U.S. And in this article they said, in addition to providing immediate humanitarian assistance, the U.S. response to the tragic earthquake in Haiti 
offers opportunities to reshape Haiti's long dysfunctional government and economy, as well as to improve the public image of the United States in that region. You won't find this on the website because people made such a scandal after it was seen that they immediately took it down. Both New Orleans and Haiti have been sources of profit based on the exploitation of others. In New Orleans, the developers, who are for the most part rich and white, have made money off of development itself and off of tourism, which is really nothing more than the marketing of the fruits of African-American culture to people, which in this case were meant to exclude the African-Americans that New Orleanians were delighted to get rid of. In Haiti, as Ezuli mentioned, the reconstruction plan, the linchpin of redevelopment of both the U.S. and the U.N. is the expansion of sweatshops where people earn a pitifully unlivable wage of $3.09 a day. Both have had reconstruction based on legalized subminimum wage. In Haiti, this is happening as cash for work programs, cleaning up rubble, through which there has been an exemption in the minimum wage. And in New Orleans, it's primarily through Latino laborers. And for this, Bush suspended the Davis-Bacon Act, which protects minimum wage and other workers' rights. There was a huge uprising about this too, and he had to reverse that decision, but he actually said that it was okay not to pay minimum wage in New Orleans. In both cases, there, were hu there has been huge money for repair and reconstruction going to outside experts, both NGOs and corporations. This is in part, as I mentioned, because the elite doesn't believe that the local people are up to the challenge. But in Haiti and New Orleans both, what we see are many U.S. contracts going to multinationals well-connected to the U.S. administration and to nobody more than the Clintons. There is a revolving door in contracts from Iraq to Afghanistan to New Orleans to Haiti, especially in terms of security. Many of these are no-bid contracts, and they're going to friends of the Clintons and others well-placed in Washington. Since Ezuli spoke mainly about Haiti, I'll just touch on a few elements of the disaster capitalism as it's manifested in New Orleans. We saw this model that had two elements to it in New Orleans, and we're still seeing it. One is ethnic cleansing, and the other is privatization. The ethnic cleansing it was really remarkable for me as a white person who has the rare privilege, I guess, of having other white people as, you know, assume commonality with me and thus open their mouths and say the most unbelievable things, to hear things like one woman say to me, one good thing that came from Katrina is a change in population, so now finally we'll be able to elect some good people. Good, of course, being code for white. We all heard Barbara Bush visit the Astrodome in Houston right afterwards where there were all of these desperate people living, you know, like animals on these cots, long further than they ever should have stayed there. And she said, you know, they were underprivileged anyway, so this is working out very well for them. I could go on and on and on, but you all know this already. Of the 100,000 people who never returned home, most of them were black and poor because they had no right to return. Now white folk in New Orleans have both financial and political power. I could give many, many examples, but I don't have time. But just to give you one, one in four black-owned businesses in New Orleans and in Biloxi have closed down since Katrina. And this is a rate 52 times higher than white-owned businesses. This May, the people elected a white mayor of the city for the first time in 32 years. He, his election was largely supported by the African-American population, but this is a place we would not have gotten to in the past. And we now have a predominantly white city council for the first time in decades. Privatization is the second element, and this has been extraordinary. New Orleans has really been an experiment of what it means to fully privatize the system. And Hurricane Katrina and the resulting disaster gave them the opportunity they need, and I'll take it in the three major social elements, education, housing, and health care, the three fundamentals uh, that, that people can maybe expect to receive some help from in the state, unless you're from New Orleans. In terms of education, Milton Friedman, I'm sure you all know the father of uh, neoliberal ideology, came out of retirement a few months after Katrina at the age of 90 came out of retirement specifically to write a piece in the Wall Street Journal, an editorial, that said, this is a tragedy. 
It is also an opportunity to radically reform the educational system. One of the very first acts of city government after Katrina was to fire the entire public school system staff, 7,500 people from administrators and headmasters to teachers to janitors. At the same time, the city withdrew recognition of the union. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm sure that's a wholly illegal act, but many things have been. The public school system has since been gutted, and currently three quarters of the New Orleans schools are managed charters, and I have heard that there are plans to fully do away with public schooling in New Orleans. They created something called the Recovery School District, which manages 34 traditional schools and another 33 that are independently run, which operates completely outside of the New Orleans government. Power was taken away from the New Orleans government, and it has very, very little uh, power from the teachers' union. One of the things that they have done and are going to continue to do is to put in the largest core of Teach for America that has ever existed. And while Teach for America youth have a lot to offer the schools, the kids have often been used as a way to undermine teachers' unions. Because here you have these volunteers who come in and take the power away. It's very interesting to note that the man who is the head of the recovery school district in New Orleans, who oversaw this whole thing, is now the architect of the blueprint working with Bill Clinton and the UN in Haiti to remake the school systems in Haiti. He said it's going to be the revolu greatest revolution that Haiti has seen. Housing. After Katrina, homelessness rose, you can imagine. We lost half of our housing there, or it was damaged, with almost 5% of the city, or 12,000 people, homeless. So at the same time as you have 12,000 people on the streets, public housing projects were not damaged in the storm. They were among the few buildings that weren't because they were brick. They were structurally sound. Those houses were mainly empty, as most residents, who were black and poor, had been evacuated. But instead of making that housing available to homeless people, what did the city do? It decided that this was the time, this time of massive crisis in housing, when so many others, not included in this homeless statistic, could not return home because their home was ruined and they had nowhere to go, so they were living on their auntie's floor in Atlanta, or somewhere in Houston, or somewhere in Seattle, or anywhere. Instead, the city decided to demolish all of the public housing after Katrina. Just to give one example, um, there was one public housing project that would have cost $85 million to renovate, but $100 million to demolish. What did they do? They chose to demolish it. It makes no point of view from the, it makes no sense from the point of view of financial logic, but in terms of disaster capitalism at work, excuse me, at work, and the ideology of neoliberalism, it makes a lot of sense. Healthcare, this is perhaps the most shocking. Before the storm, New Orleans had one public hospital called Charity. It was created in 1736, and it treated hundreds of thousands of patients per year. It was number two in the country in terms of trauma treatment. This building was not structurally damaged. It suffered damage in the basement, but it wasn't damaged, and the military immediately cleaned it up to where it could be reopened immediately. And what you had were people who were traumatized, who had lost their access to you know, mental health drugs, to all sorts of medical care, who were homeless, who desperately needed care. Here's Charity Hospital ready to go, structurally sound and cleaned up. And guess what? Three weeks after Katrina, the Louisiana uh, state government chose to close it down. They selected this moment to close the thing down. It's closed to this day. I'm sure that they will never reopen it. And they have since destroyed all the records of people who have been treated there ever since their birth. Mm -hmm. Didn't even announce this and give people the chance, for example, who might have been living outside of, of New Orleans at the time, waiting to come home, the chance to come back and get their records. No alternative health care has been offered, and low-income people are without free options. So you can actually see how the ethnic cleansing and the privatization work hand in hand. One keeps the other from coming home, but of course it does far more in a nation that is just hell-bent on privatizing everything. In terms of citizen response, back to the comparison between New Orleans and Haiti, there's been so much grassroots organizing to switch the power balance, to get people's voice included in the decision making, and to ensure that the corporations and the developers and the government and other ne'er-do-wells are not profiting from their misery. Because after all, who knows better than the majority what they need? Uh, and who should benefit most about decisions from reconstruction than those who are most adversely impacted?
Here I'll speak more about the case of Haiti because that's where uh, most of my work has been with peasant movements and women's movements and democracy movements and human rights movements and others. Here the people's perspective since January 12th has been sorely, sorely lost. Ezuli referred to this interim commission. This is actually the most pernicious thing and everyone in the United States needs to know this and please leave here and tell 20 people. Haiti is now legally a protectorate. There was a constitutional coup that occurred in mid-April and Haiti is now run by something called the Interim Commission for the Reconstruction of Haiti. Its mandate is for 18 months, 18 months coinciding with the state of emergency that the parliament voted in. What the Haitian parliament did was vote to cede all of its powers over to this body, which keeps growing, but at last count it was 28, 14 Haitians and 14 foreigners. And how do you get a seat on this august body? You buy it. So it's the inter, um, it's the IMF, it's the World Bank, it's the Inter-American Development Bank, it's the, it's Canada, it's the US, it's France, it's all of these powers, the UN, and the way you get a seat on it is that your institution has either given a hundred million since the earthquake or canceled 200 million in debt, which of course debt, which whose principal has long been paid anyway, to Haiti. This is totally secret body. Most Haitians, even radicals, even students, even people who care profoundly know nothing about it, and there's no way to find out anything about it. There are no public statements. There is no phone number that you can call. There is to be no report issued. So uh, power has completely been taken away from the Haitian people, and they have no idea who has taken it or why. I've been able to scout around and have published everything I've found, and a few other folks in Haiti have too, but almost no one knows. And this is their country. They elected a president. The single shred of power that the Haitian president has is to veto what the CIRH, this interim commission, decides. But everyone knows that President Preval won't do that, and we're pretty sure that whatever president they allow to come in as of November 28th and the new elections will not be allowed to do that too. And again, because the government has been basically dissolved and everything is happening behind closed doors, we'll have no way of knowing even if there is a free election in Haiti. So of course, given this, this this CIRH, this commission, whose mandate is to determine the development path of Haiti, which of course means giving it full power for the restructuring of the whole financial and economic condition of the country, the Haitian people have absolutely no one who is accountable to them, who, in whom they have a democratic voice. So you can imagine for the popular movement, this weakens their capacity a lot. But nevertheless, nevertheless, Fortunately, in Haiti, much more so than in New Orleans, there is this strong tradition of organizing among popular movements. Who comprises the popular movements? It's the peasants that Ezuli spoke of, it's women, it's youth, it's students, it's radical clergy and laity, it's workers, it's unemployed, it's shantytown dwellers, it's market women. It is all of these things that has made Haiti such a vibrant and radical culture. Haitian people will tell you with pride, we are a rebellious society. And yes, they attain this incredible incredible slave re revolution in 1804 and they have never ever stopped advocating for what they know to be theirs. Beginning the week of the earthquake, even when some people still didn't know where their child was, who was trapped under rubble, even though they may have just buried their partner that morning, even though they may have a leg still in the cast from when a building fell on them, the week of the earthquake, these groups began assembling to determine their say in the future of the country. And there's a very clear consensus on the priorities for reconstructing the country, or what many Haitians call constructing the country, because they say we want nothing that reconstructs what we had before, because what we had before only serves a small elite, this group that Ezuli spoke of. And so I'll just give you a briefly what the points are in the reconstruction of Haiti. One is creating- One point, uh, actually before you continue, can you just, uh, as part of that, can you include what is the return and resettlement strat strategy, draft five? Mm -hmm. If you can. Yep. Very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yes. I now will add that into. Yes, I will. Uh, okay, so the first is uh, creating participatory democracy. And this is, again, as I mentioned before, the government must serve the people and be accountable to them and include their participation. Second is rebuilding under a new economic paradigm 
one which breaks free of the old path where agricultural production is undermined by unfair trade rules, where food and many other basics are imported, and where a coveted job is working as a sweatshop worker. Social movements are just adamant that Haiti from here on out has to include principles of economic justice, including rules that privilege Haitian producers and Haitian goods, food sovereignty, employment opportunities, and workers' rights. Putting social needs at the center is critical, and here there is no group more needy and more deserving and, and more unjustly treated than the 1.5 or so million people who are still living 10 months after the way that pigs might live on a farm. They have no roof. They have uh, shredded tarps, most of them, where rains are coming in. So many of them were destroyed in this most recent tropical storm and in earlier storms. They have no floor, so they're sleeping in the mud. They're completely exhausted and sick all the time, even pre-cholera, because of this. And so 10 months later, we have finally, with the help of some investigative journalist friends, found the plan for the U.S. and the U.N. that no one has ever known because it's never been made available to the people. And it is this three-point plan um, um, that Judith just referred to, that is utterly absurd. It lays out plans for a technical um, shift in these camps, like returning people to their homes. But something like 96, uh, 95 to 98 percent of the rubble, as Ezuli said, is still remaining on people's homes. I mean, this rubble is huge. This is not a little rubble. It's like, you know, you walk down the streets where there are hills the size of room that are filled with rubble. So every single element of that point is absurd and furthermore there is no political will to get these people out of camps. They've just been forgotten like the folks in New Orleans in the formaldehyde filled FEMA trailers. So people are saying, and I got this list, I sat down with a group of women in a refugee camp and this was the list that they came up with so I can't think of anybody who is more expert than they in terms of what their social needs are and this is the priority they gave. Housing first, food healthcare, education, and work. So they're demanding that this be placed at the center of the reconstruction. Privileging agriculture. In a country where the rural farming population comprises 65 to 80 percent, depending on who you ask, redeveloping peasant agriculture is critical. It's been destroyed in two ways. One is by two IMF standby agreements that reduce trade tariffs, in some cases from 50 percent to 0.5 percent. Hmm? Yep. And uh, the second is um, today by the dumping of uh, food aid by U.S. agriculture, which made it, which has made it almost impossible for farmers to compete. Um, I'm just going to close with one little paragraph here. Um, yep. I'm just going to say that the last is ensuring women and children's rights. But I just want to close with one very common expression of the, the sentiment of the Haitian people and their determination. And this is a quote by a man who works at the platform to advocate alternative development in Haiti named Lico Jean-Pierre. And you can hear this exact same sentiment um, and the hope and the faith and the determination behind it expressed all over Haiti. He said, sadness can't discourage us so that we stop fighting. We've lost people as in many battles, but we have to continue fighting to honor them and make their dreams a reality. The dream is translated into a slogan, another Haiti is possible. All right, thank you so much, Beverly. Now we have Tambale Monsabili of Friends of the Congo. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Try to wake you guys up. Good evening. Good evening. Good, 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 good. Um, my name is Kambala. I work for Friends of the Congo. Uh, we are an advocacy group based in Washington, D.C. And what we do is we raise awareness globally about the situation in the Congo. We try to provide support and uh, networks uh, to people who are on the ground, um, who are fighting day in and day out for the past, I don't know, 400 years to try to create some sovereignty. Uh, where, whereby the people of the Congo are controlling the resources. And from uh, all the discussion that ju they have just spoken, the one thing that's really common from Haiti uh, to New Orleans is resource exploitation. And what I've seen in the work that we do is that uh, it's really rare to connect the dot, that uh, for people to advocate to end apartheid and forget Liberia, or for people to try to solve the issue of New Orleans and forget Haiti or for people to try to end the killing of six million Congolese there and forget that Nepal and India have an issue that we have to deal with with the water. 
So the issue of exploitation around the world is all connected, and it's, it's really going to be up to us, uh, people who understand it, to, to know that, as um, Dr. King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So um, I wrote up a few points in regard to uh, disaster capitalism, you know, speaking even uh, to Judith earlier. You know, uh, we can use that term, uh, but at the end of the day, it's really exploitation of the people where you are maximizing profit and not considering uh, the human beings living on the land as human beings, but as, more so as commodities that you can remove uh, from different areas. Uh, in the context of the Congo, you know, the war officially ended in 2002, and that's really where we saw how disaster capitalism really came into play, where we saw directly the IMF and World Bank coming in into the Congo, and they actually wrote the mining laws and the forestry laws of the Congo. And as they came in, uh, they literally bankrupted a state, uh, a state fir uh, mining firm called Jekamine, who controlled most of the assets of the country, where they privatized uh, the, uh, the mining assets of the country and gave it to foreign corporations. You know, we saw the Freeport McMurray coming in. We saw Barrow out of Canada coming in. Uh, we saw even um, Adastra, which was American mining field, and was so common by everything that we're saying. The same name came coming up, but nobody has arrested him yet. Bill Clinton, you know, he has done a lot of things around the world, and some of the situation that we are seeing in the Congo unfold today is due to U.S. foreign policy under the Bill Clinton administration, uh, where they, they favor strong men uh, who will give unfettered access to the resources. Um, so the other thing that happened also, besides just um, stripping the mining assets from uh, Jekamine, uh, one of the uh, top mining companies in the Congo, um, they fired, as soon as they uh, privatized um, the asset, they fired their employees. Uh, some of the things that pro they promised their employees was a pay, a compensation for them losing the job. Up till today, they haven't received that pay. Um, the, the laws as I share with you, that governed how we mine really was written by the IMF World Bank. So how we cut the trees in the Congo, for example, is really uh, in a way where we don't even understand it's going to affect our ecological system. You know, Congo has the second largest rainforest in the world. Uh, did you know that there is a serious problem with an American company here uh, the uh, cutting trees like there is no tomorrow? He's an American guy. Nobody knows his name. Living right here in New Jersey. Look him up. Elwin Blackner. Right here in New Jersey. And he runs Elwin Blackner. Elwin is E L W I N, a Y N, and Blackner is B L A T T N E R. There is a documentary called Enjoy Poverty 3 uh, that was done by Renzo Martins, uh, where he filmed uh, him in the Congo. Uh, because uh, the situation with this guy is kind of interesting. So he has this plantations that he took over. Some of them are around uh, the Lake Maindombe. And the Lake Maindombe, historically, is where Leopold II hid a plantation that other foreign nations did not know. That's actually one of the plantations that got him in trouble. Beside other nations exploiting resources 100 years ago in the Congo, in the Lake Maindombe, he had a closed plantation that nobody knew, and he was exploiting it at a, I mean, a maximum profit getting rubber out of the Congo. So that area uh, right now, Elwin Blackner, his firm is the Blackner Group, owns it. And th they are cutting trees and getting into the rainforest. And uh, he has about six plantations. And the average employee uh, numbers of employees in the plantation is about 3,000 employees per plantation. 3,000, about 3,000. Uh, and um, just to give you an example of how much the employees in the plantation are paid, one of them was asked uh, by Renzo, uh, asked, have you ever bought a TV? He said, no. Oh, have you ever bought a suit? No. How long have you been working? 10 years. You haven't been able to save money to buy a suit or a coat? I said, oh, if I work a little hard, you know, I'm, I'm going to get more money. And while he was talking to him, he was just laid off. Now, here's how interesting the concept of laid off is. You are laid off, but you have to come to work to prove that you can work again. So he was working at the plantation as an unofficial employee, not getting a salary, so he could get his job back. And he was being interviewed by Renzo for that. So now, the other issue that took place was that the children in that village, 
the, the different villages who are around have issues of malnutrition. You know, you have kids who are really sick, and I mean, really horrific images. I was even uh, angry when I watched the film because Renzo filmed these kids there. Then he took the, uh, the um, Doctors Without Borders, did the studies around the village. They had the documentation of uh, what was happening there. Of course, there was no pressure on Ellen Blattner. So he takes the footage and he goes and sees Ellen Blattner. Of course, he didn't know why he was filming him. And then in the middle of the interview, so he presents him the fact, you no, know, you have a, these children in this village who are malnourished and this and that. And the most outrageous thing I heard from his mouth was his defense. He said, well, uh, let's say I have a thousand children in these villages who are malnourished. If about eight or 18 of them die, I'm doing pretty good. Now, this guy knew that there are people who are dying there of malnutrition and his employees are not paid and still was able to say that on camera. You know why he said that on camera? Because it was done in French and he never knew that it's going to be translated in English and be shown now here around the world. But of course, I share with you, he's right in New Jersey, take the PATH train, say hello to his house, <laughs> citizen arrest. I hope you guys can perform that whenever you are able. <laughs> I'll make sure that you get that. But uh, now to, to come back to even Naomi Klein's uh, perspective of disaster capitalism, uh, to show you, without getting into the more details of what is happening now, simple facts. Six million people have died since 1996. Half of them are children under the age of five. 500,000 of women brutally raped, all in an attempt to get access to Congo's resources. Something in Haiti, something in New Orleans. But it's happening right now. The worst crisis since World War II, the deadliest conflict today. But in that context, in 2002, when the Congo was at its weakest test, that's when the imperialist powers came in with the IMF and World Bank to institute laws that govern how we control our land. And with that, Congo has been sold a wholesale for the next generations, that it will take a leadership from the people to really reverse the current current, uh, the current that's taking place right now. Now, what are people doing? You no, know, there are a lot of issues I can talk about. I can talk about the rebels in the East who, are, who have control of the East. I can talk about the government in, the, in Kinshasa, in the West of Congo, who ruled by the gun and have kept people in check. You speak up, you killed. You know, they killed uh, Amatungulu, uh, supposedly who was an activist who threw a stone at uh, the president's convoy. Um, he was arrested and uh, supposedly he committed suicide in his prison cell. Uh, we have another one, Chebea, who died June the 1st, also a strong activist. So many people who speak up in the civil society and people who are fighting, they are in harm's way, just like during the apartheid movement. Now, what are they doing? Um, I will speak about Katanga, because that's where the most vibrant labor movement is located. Uh, and Katanga to my standard, is the richest area of the Congo. That's what, what you don't hear about. The largest copper reserve in the world is located in Katanga and is controlled by an American company called Freeport McMoran. You don't hear about that. 64% of the cobalt in the world, a mineral that is essential to the aerospace and military industry of the United States, is in the Zambia Congo uh, belt, copper belt. You have companies there such as OM Group out of Cleveland, Ohio, who are getting that uh, cobalt, but they were able to receive it at wholesale price due to the mining laws of first law that existed and an elite government um, that is giving them a federal access to those resources. Um, now, with the resistance, the most successful, uh, what are the, the civil society doing? They are writing, they are writing a report, they are uh, publishing it, and they are providing it to porters. So some of the civil society in Katanga publishing their report have been able to get it down to South Africa, to Southern Africa Resource Watch. Uh, we close carbon, but we make sure that people know what is happening with the Freeport McMoran and what they're supposed to do. But the challenge now with what they're publishing is to getting it to the American civil society so that the labor movement here can connect with the people who are in the Congo, just like we did with South Africa. Uh, the second thing that uh, we saw from the civil society, um, I think in around 2004, if I'm not mistaken, I hope uh, my date is correct, uh, 
the civil society initiated a mining review of the contract because we had many mining, com uh, mining companies who came in while the conflict was happening to get sweet deals. Uh, some of the, the average percentage that came back to the commodity state was around 12% for most of the mining operations. But through civil society push, uh, they actually had some partners here who kind of helped. The Carter Center at uh, Atlanta kind of helped. And some of the uh, Southern African Resource Watch in South Africa and uh, some uh, Dutch organization pushing to renegotiate those contracts. Uh, the Lutundula Commission was launched, found out that about 65 companies were, I mean, their contract was really odious and definitely detrimental to the company. I mean, you have a company such as Banro, who has a gold mine right where the conflict is taking place in Eastern Congo, and they make a 100% profit on the gold that, that comes out of there. They made an initial payment to rebels, and they don't make anything to the, uh, to the country. So with that pressure on the civil society, that created the uh, a mining review. It was a very good action from the civil society who really, I mean, made people were really uh, attacked for the actions on the ground. But they pushed through, and it went through. But what, what was unfortunate with the mining review was that the government took it, and now is using it to bribe, uh, to blackmail mining corporations. I said, oh, well, the Congolese say you need to renegotiate, but you need to pay some $150 million. Uh, uh, let me change the number. $17 million for illegal immigration that Freeport McMurray did, supposedly, so that you can stay in power. But at the same time, that's not benefiting the people. So that's why it's very important with the labor and civil society who are fighting in Congo to be connected with you just as the free uh, South African movement was there. So while people are advocating for issues there, you can show up here and say, it's not okay for Freeport McMoran to bribe politicians in the Congo. How do you know that? Because you have labor movement in the Congo where provided you with the information of what is happening. Uh, some of the movement uh, also within Katanga was a blockage of roads. Uh, there is a main road that goes, I think, to Ndola. In many, uh, many instances, the workers organized to block those roads because that's where the transit of the copper and cobalt leaving the Congo goes through. It goes through Zambia, then it finds its way out. And they've organized uh, sometimes successfully, uh, but of course with the paramilitary forces and private securities that exist into mine, many of uh, you guys may now be aware of that. Uh, sometimes those forces, are, the labor forces are crushed, you know, either shot, killed, but they continue, of course, to do those blockage. Um, the last point I, I will add in terms of that, I'm insisting in connecting you here with what is happening on the ground. And I only spoke to you from one aspect of what is happening in the Congo, looking at what are people doing in the Katanga province to address the issues they have, the labor movement that exists. But what you should know about the Congo is they have a very vibrant civil society, a very vibrant labor movement. The challenge that they face is that they are not connected with people around the world. So, Free Pop McMoran is not just in Congo. It's also in uh, Equatorial Guinea. Some of the companies, I'm, I think I'm gonna look them up with say, Majesco, Saint Genevieve, to see how they are also connected uh, with uh, the different companies who are there. They all work on a global level, but we are addressing countries by countries, issues by issues, not realizing that it's not really about Palestine. You have Benny Steinman's in the Congo with an Israeli. Dan Gottler in the Congo with an Israeli making billions of dollars. He made $175 million in five months. Do you want to know how he made that? So, Congolese government take away a mine from a Canadian company called First Quento. Very big fuss. People do not understand the geopolitical aspect of that contract. First Quento received that mine. Oh, Bill Clinton is coming back again. So, Bill Clinton's homeboy, his name is Jean-Raymond Bull. He's a Canadian guy. He's actually uh, from um, Il Maurice, I don't know. Mauritius? There you go. He's from Mauritius, right? And uh, he has a Canadian passport. I had this American company called American Mineral Fields, based out of where? Hope, Arkansas. During the war in the Congo, he provided the rebels with airplanes, and money. He actually flew investors 
from the U.S. to the Congo a week before the rebels took over the country in 1997. He received from that a gold, a, I'm sorry, a diamond concession worth one billion dollars. He's all the own boy. I'm sorry to be saying that because they make me so angry because I know the names and how they operate. Uh, Robert Stewart, who worked for Bechtel, was able to provide um, logistical support for rebels. Do you know what that means? Bechtel worked in NASA. So they have access to NASA satellites and they provided the logistics to rebel forces taking, coming into Congo. So in all that sweet deal, they made money. So here's now how it becomes complicated. It's the company is called American Mineral Fields. It comes out in the news, a lot of bad names, uh, things of the nature. They changed the name of the company. You saw that with Blackwater. So the company becomes Adastra. So people will not know this is the same company that works with rebels. Then after the mining review goes around, they start taking away the, uh, the mining companies away from some of this, this company. They, change it. They, they don't change the name, but they sell it to someone else. They sell it to First Quantum, which is the Canadian mining firm. So First Quantum was listed there. Now here's how crazy this is. Now, the companies looting the Congo are invested. They have investment from the World Bank. How so? The International Finance Corporation in the tune of $1 billion, have risk uh, insurance, so equity stake, within First Quantum. So it's in the best interest that this company looting the Congo is not out. And they wrote the mining laws and they wrote the forest laws so they know how they can get in there for the contract. Last year, uh, for the past two years, there have been a serious clash between China and the U.S. because of Congo's copper and Congo's cobalt. First, no, they cancel first quantum, cancel Freeport uh, Mac McMoran contract. It was a big fuss. Wait a minute. Freeport McMoran, World Bank, through I uh, IFC, has investment in it. First quantum, have investment in it. So, one of the rebel leaders in the Congo tells the Congolese government, I'm not going to stop fighting until you renegotiate the Chinese contract. Laurent Kunda is removed. On the Financial Times, this was actually written on the Financial Times, the IMF publicly come and said, we are not happy with the Chinese contract coming to get what? Um, well, it was uh, what? 10 million tons of copper and 600,000 tons of cobalt. That's a lot. Of, that's a huge number, right? Uh, well, Freeport McMoran has 100 million tons of copper, which is 10 times the Chinese. That's just one company. Not a story. Yeah, to me, I'll finish that up. So we've... We've uh, now IMF coming publicly saying we need you to renegotiate that. The Congolese government decided to do so. So it's been a long talk going on what is going to happen. Hillary Clinton shows up in the Congo. All you heard about it in the news, what you heard about her was that she went to see the rape victim. She's going to give us $17 million. But what you didn't know was when she was flying into Congo, she was with the head of the IMF and World Bank. When they left the Congo, the $9 billion contract of China became $6 billion. Freeport had problem with the Congo. They made sure that it was, uh, I, the words that I received, that she made clear that we need to make sure that the American company is taken care of. The Congolese government didn't hear that. So in the beginning of this year, uh, our black boy, what's his name? I'm sorry to call him black boy, he's an elder too. Ambassador Carson goes to the Congo. <laughs> Ambassador Carson at the State Department. He goes to the Congo, and in a press conference in Kinshasa, he says, we would like the Congolese government to normalize the situation with Freeport McMurray. Now, this is a company that displaced people, caused environmental degradation, have the largest copper reserve, and had on the mining review less than 12% profit given to the Congo. Now, an ambassador is saying that. But with all of these games, right, what we will end up talking about is what? Africans wantonly killing each other, not even showing where the weapon factory exists, not even talking about the oligarchs who control uh, the situation there, and who are the real money changers. And I hope after tonight, we all can connect and connect the dots. Don't just fight for the Congo. I don't want you to come and help the Congo. I want you to help the world, because all this situation is the same people, Bill Clinton, for example, doing that all around the world, and we really need the support of ordinary people to come together to address this issue of disaster capitalism. Thank you.
Okay, so now we have Adonar Usmani. Adonar Uh, hi, good evening, guys. Um, so, I, I'll, I'll just go quickly because I, I feel like uh, time is short. Um, so, so in the time that I have, I, I want to basically do two things um, uh, to address this sort of topic at hand, uh, disaster capitalism, specifically disaster capitalism in Pakistan. So first, what I'd like to do is give you a sense of the recent history in Pakistan. You know, I, I, as I think people have already spoken about the mainstream media frames natural disasters very, very poorly. When it comes to the floods in Pakistan, the inadequacy of their treatment was only exacerbated by the frames of the war and Islamophobia and things like this. So some sense of the structural and political context in which the floods unfolded is critical. Without it, uh, I would argue, one can't make any sense of the toll that the, the, that the waters have taken on Pakistan and, and its poor. Um, and then in the second part, I want to argue, and really I shouldn't overstate the extent to which this is an argument, as opposed to just an observation of some very sad facts, the, that precisely this same policy package, i.e. neoliberalism, is being forced on the Pakistani people amidst ongoing war and in the climate of acute crisis following the recent floods. The exact same stinking cocktail of bad economics and ruling class rapaciousness is under the aegis of a 25-month IMF plan, which Pakistan is currently uh, unfortunately engaged in, is in the process of being implemented. So these are the sort of two things that I want to do. Um, so the first thing is the history of neoliberalism in Pakistan. Um, there can be some discussion about, about the precise year to which you date the neoliberal turn. Um, a strong case could be made for 1977. I don't know how many people are familiar with the history uh, of Pakistan, but that was the year that our second military dictator took, took power in 1977. Um, Zial Haq, and he was ably supported by the United States, especially in the 80s when there